What would you think if you woke up one day to news that we had discovered an alien civilization? Over the years, many have speculated about the effects of such a discovery on human civilization. What would such a discovery mean for us? No doubt, some would simply not believe it, others might not care, and still others might panic. And the context will be important. If it's a distant signal from a civilization in some other part of the galaxy, that would be one thing. But if it were close, it would be another. My guest today is a fellow science fiction author who has done extensive research into the psychology of first contact for his work, and we dig directly into what might happen if and when we discover evidence of an alien civilization. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. is joined today by Trevor B. Williams. Trevor is a science fiction author whose novel Eternal Shadow was recently published. His passion in the sciences were driven by his love of fiction novels and TV shows alike, both of which received equal billing during his formative years in Brooklyn, New York. Trevor Williams, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, John. It is a, it is a pleasure. Now, Trevor, you have a book out, Eternal Shadow, Fall of Gods, and the overall overarching premise of this book is First Contact. Can you give us a little spoiler-free synopsis of the story here? Sure. So, in 2014, a signal of undeniable alien origin is detected over the surface of Pluto. Three days later, the source of that signal, an object of unimaginable size, destroys Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus. Scientists determine that this object will take about 10 years to reach Earth. And our protagonists, two SETI researchers and the CEO of a large corporation, find themselves as unlikely allies in the race to determine what, if anything, can be done to save us. Now, you did a lot of research. This is a hard sci-fi book, which are particularly close to my heart. What sort of research did you put in just to even write this? You know, that's a great question. And the research covers a variety of different fields. One big area that I really wanted to nail down was how humanity as a species would react to something of this magnitude occurring within our own solar system and and grasping with the idea that within a certain amount of time, we may not exist anymore. Uh, this kind of led me to a variety of different paths in the fields of psychology. There was one paper that I found online by Dr. Michael Shetshi, which kind of talks about talks about first contact and ha and depending on what that contact looks like, he kind of explores different directions in which uh, humanity may may respond. And it's and it's not just about you know. A sh like ships coming to Earth, but you know, it covers the more uh, nuanced forms of contact, such as radio contact from light years away. How would people react? Would they crawl under their beds and pray, or will they just keep on going as if you know nothing actually changed in their lives? And there were several different conclusions that he drew in terms of how humanity, as a, as a species, should proceed given that we haven't yet made first contact with, with anything. Um, he showed there are three distinct uh, directions. The first was protective isolationism, where humanity would basically cease attempting to make contact with anyone, like end steady research, end blatant broadcasts of our existence to, to the cosmos. The second direction was uh, concerted global preparations. So essentially preparing mankind for the day that we make first contact, whether that's radio contact from a species 
like many light years away or the aliens coming to us physically uh, basically you know preparing humanity on a psychological social and religious like religious and socio-economic levels like basically you know preparing us as best as we can without actually knowing whether or not something will happen and then the last position that that he said we could potentially go is enlargement of our metaphorical coastal strip so basically you know settling our solar system expanding beyond the earth leaving the cradle in which we're currently in because right now in the grand scheme of things all of our eggs are in one basket and that is earth and if anything were to come to us whether it is biological or chemical or in, or has some other form of nature that we just cannot understand or fathom and we're just and if we're not prepared you know we could very well just see ourselves regress significantly and so enlarge, enlarging our coastal strip expanding beyond earth would be another more permanent long-term solution towards how we would handle first contact there are also some articles that I've picked up from Psychology Today, which also spoke a lot about how people respond to different kinds of external stressors and the idea of territoriality. So taking this to the discussion of first contact, if there were, if we ever discovered that, some, that, something, or, that something came within our own solar system and we identified it as as extraterrestrial in origin, what could that mean for humanity as a whole? And the answer largely, like, and the answer is, is all over the place. I mean, even if they don't do anything, just the sheer, just the evidence that they exist could completely change how people behave, like upswells in people attending churches or people choosing to not pay their taxes. <laughs> nice. It seems to me that this would be very situational, though, because if you get just some distant SETI signal, you know, just a just a, a, a signal, um, let's say 1420 megahertz hydrogen line. So that's going to be different and have a different social impact than a, a, a von Neumann probe radioing us from the orbit of Mars or something would. So it would seem to me that it just depends on what form this takes. Um, what was the, how did they deal with that? You know, did they look through any sort of scenarios and say, well, this is going to be worse than this? Yeah, there, so, so there were different, there were different directions that first contact was explored. In the case of something like radio contact, for example, especially in modern day where there's so many ways in which people can simply tune out something as momentous as first contact. I mean, there's, it would be entirely plausible that, you know, like SETI and other institutions, you know, have processes and protocols that are supposedly in place to kind of deal with the eventuality that we make radio contact with, a, with another species. However, if it's radio contact, you know, there may be a f very large amounts of news coverage for a short period of time, but in the end, it's nothing that outside of the scientific community, the majority would likely kind of stick themselves to in terms of a truly life-changing event. Now, if it's something that's physical in nature, as you said, like a, like a von Neumann probe, slowly converting the matter of a nearby planet that we could see with our telescopes, with like, you know, just store-bought telescopes, that's something that, on the other hand, could have a profound impact on how we ultimately respond to it. It could be something as, like, I guess, I guess the main difference is something that is physical that we can actually see that really can that really changes the game when compared to something that is more abstract like a radio signal if it's something that that we're able to actually see with our eyes 
to an extent, that would be a very profound difference in, in response. I think it's also going to depend, too, on what we actually know about it. Because if we, if we get a SETI signal, you know, radio signal, that's from, I don't know, 500 light years away, so some distance, and we just look at it and we see it, and it's just a signal and there's no information, it's just somebody's radar, you know, something like that, mm -hmm. that we've just inadvertently intercepted. That's going to be a lot different of a story than if we run across something that we do have information about. For example, say we come across a machine civilization. One could say the Reapers from Mass Effect. And that we see this terrifying machine civilization doing things in the Milky Way. That's a lot different than if it's just some signal that we accidentally picked up and all we can say is, well, those aliens have radar, you know? So right. it would have a very different psychological effect because of those, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. Similar to uh, Eternal Shadow losing two gas giants in our own galactic backyard, as it were, is would have a very profound sociological impact. It's something that I feel is just really fascinating, especially if I think the biggest thing is whether or not there's any kind of threat to us. You know, people can certainly perceive that, oh, we've detected radio signals from another world. What does that mean? And people can immediately start dropping their own hypotheses as to the intentions of the, the originators of that signal. However, if it's something like the Reapers or like the object in my book, then that kind of changes, that can potentially change everything. Again, I think then it's just a matter of time. You know, is there any amount, is there a significant gap of time between anything physical or tangible that we see happening and that happening coming to Earth? Or like, is it five years, a thousand years? And that was an area that I also found very interesting regarding humanity in terms of attention and attention versus our own sense of like self-preservation like what like what does it take to keep an individual sufficiently you know happy or content with their life and when you look at things you know like what does it take for someone to really want to survive and once i think and this is something where i kind of think about maslow's hierarchy to, to an extent or his pyramid where you kind of cover just the bases, like if they have the food and food, water and everything. But if they, but if what is coming to us or what may or may not be coming to us takes a very long time, who's going to be paying who? And if there's nothing that's actually changing for the masses, who will be paying attention to this threat? So essentially, if the threat is coming the um if the threat is coming from something that we can may never have any interaction with or it if we do have interaction it's going to be in five thousand years then people just go back to their normal regular lives and they just say well we'll deal with that when it comes but if it's something that's immediate then that's when you know something that just say something comes and enters orbit of earth one day then that's different that's an immediate threat or a perceived threat anyway so people, I guess, would react completely differently in that case and basically freak out, right? Yeah, so that's kind of taking it to the extreme. So something like in District 9, where, I mean, although I feel like the, the overall response in that was probably not as dramatic as I would have imagined, but something like if they come literally to us, you know, there are spaceships that come to our planet could be any like, and there's so many different movies that explore different avenues of this you know then even if they don't do anything just them being that can cause an incredible impact on us and not and like pr probably large even first world countries like we're talking you know potential for anarchy or collapse of less stable nations in the world just by an alien presence 
just being. A great analogy to this would be something akin to Christopher Columbus. And it's, it's, it's the idea of a, not just a technological disparity between two parties, but sociological as well. You know, when the Spaniards and soon after, you know, uh, like Western Europe started coming over across the Atlantic to what we now call the Americas, the natives, you know, were completely at awe of every, of like in, in many ways were in awe of what they were seeing, like horses, like giant ships. And, you know, it's like, it was just completely baffling to them that this technology even existed. But more, but also on top of that, their societies were just not prepared. And there, and there were many cases throughout that period of time when entire smaller civilizations in South America just simply collapsed over the years set, like following the Spaniards like, expo- like exposing themselves in, within the Americas. Was also, I mean, of course, disease was a big factor in, in a lot of that too, though, right? Mm-hmm. Disease definitely was a factor. But then it's also, you know, it's like even with disease being present, there's also the question of just peoples because of the fact that the Europeans were far more advanced in terms of their own, like the technologies and everything. It was something that people certainly would have changed in terms of just seeing what was possible. The idea of the, of the discoverers meeting the discovered. So it's essentially going back to, to sci-fi, it's what Arthur Clarke uh, mentioned, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So when we, if we were to see something like that, there's no guarantee we'd even understand it. That, that is right. I do feel that there would be certainly a point where our, under, our understanding of how the universe works would certainly come into conflict with what we may inevitably discover as time as time goes on and especially if something was ad- sufficiently advanced enough to come to us in one form or another whether it's just several probes that are just purely robotic in nature or something more grandiose like an actual interstellar spacefaring vessel so yeah so you would you would I guess the the way to put it is that if it was so advanced that you couldn't recognize it, then you wouldn't see it. So if you do see something, you're going to understand at least a little bit of it. Uh, maybe not certain aspects of it, but you're going to understand something because you're, you've obviously recognized it as an object, right? Right. You know, at, at minimum, you know, we're, you know, we're certainly not, we're certainly not stupid as species. We're certainly able to make a lot, we're able to draw quite a few conclusions from just w- from what we see. Then it's just a matter of time, you know, how much time we have to try to understand what is in front of us. If we saw something, you know, such as uh, an object larger than entire planets coming towards us, I like to think that, you know, given enough time, we would be able to crack a little bit of what was, you know, under that galactic curtain in terms of how that object propels and how that object manages to traverse interstellar distances. And we have to take a break. We are joined today by Trevor B. Williams, author of Eternal Shadow, Fall of Gods. And we're back with Trevor Williams. Now, Trevor, uh, interdisciplinary science is very important, would be very important if we discovered an object like what is in your book leviathan they're gonna have to come together and they're gonna have to figure out you know what is this object what's you know what makes it tick how would that what would that look like so in my mind given the circumstances presented in in the book and given i think the the key thing is time frame but even if we had like a period of years to figure something out uh one area that one thing i think would certainly happen behind the scenes is a lot of 
to an extent, I, w- I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't call it entirely global cooperation, but certainly a level of partnerships and setting aside certain socioeconomic concerns if it means we could come like different parties can combine their resources, their scientific aptitudes for the sake of understanding what is coming towards them for the sake of for the sake of humanity in, in, in many ways. And this can be everything from joint partnerships between government and corp- and corporations, between public and private sector to make this happen. And that's something that I, I am very strong. I do feel very strongly about it's something that we've seen in the past in terms of like major projects that like our own like the US government has taken on for example such as the interstate highway system which I feel is a very large undertaking you know, and of course the Apollo program and sending first satellites and and the first people on the moon significant amount of funds and resources and manpower were put towards programs like that and of course you know and that was just for like in the case of the apollo program you know that was largely in part competing with the soviet union and for not just technological supremacy but philosophical supremacy in terms of which ideology is right if something extraterrestrial were to make a very tangible presence within our lifetimes and that presence is what something that was in one form or another was coming to earth in a period of time that would be manageable for governments to react then i think we would certainly see a fair amount of uh, cooperation some a lot of which i feel would be behind the scenes in part because even though and and again that would also depend on whether or not the news of this extra, extraterrestrial presence was made public. This would, this could go back to something like the radio signal. Granted, it may be possible for people to pick this up using their own store-bought, store-bought equipment, possibly. But if it's something that could be concealed, is it worth concealing You know that particular event from the public for the sake of societal con- continuity? While behind the scenes, Major partnerships are made, governments pool funds and people, and maybe publicly we start to see a sudden shift in, in global space programs, and uh, you know a lot more efforts being put towards businesses like SpaceX and Ad Astra. You know, it's interesting to think about. It. It, it, there's also just to go Douglas Adams on you. There's also the possibility of the, of the alien contact being innocuous and almost funny, such as we discover a large piece of alien rebar concrete passing through the solar system. It's just their trash, you know. And essentially, if you were to walk around on parts of Earth, that would be the way that you knew that humans were here was because you would see plastic Pepsi bottles. Yes, I do feel that if in the event we we do start exploring the stars and we find evidence of extraterrestrial life, trash, space trash, is certainly something that I would not be surprised uh, would be is something that, that we would that we would discover. And it may not even be you know a, a giant piece of flying rebar. It could be a, something as innocent as. A species first moon landing and their equipment just kind of frozen in time over eons whereas the home planet might have been completely blasted away for one reason or another so I, I do think that is that is certainly a possibility but then when or if we make those kind of discoveries it's like what do we do with that information essentially it would be the it would be you know that would be something that again, would cause an incredible wave of interest in the scientific community, but the public, in large part, I feel would not be either made aware of it or would care, Yeah, um, at least in the long term. I mean, if it's something that's, like I said, just a piece of trash of some sort, and it has no no value other than to say this came from an alien civilization, but other than that, it's just a piece of concrete. That's going to be different than if it's a derelict ship or something like that, where you're going to have governments that want it 
and you probably aren't going to find out about it. Right. But given that we have zones in the solar system where Jupiter could be collecting, you know, various uh, flotsam from around the galaxy, it's an interesting idea to think about that, that maybe first contact will be finding someone's trash. Yes, and with the Voyager probe now slowly but surely exploring the outer confines of our solar system, it's going to be very interesting to see what we end up discovering out there. Not that we'll be able to pick up too much with it in terms of physical objects, but I think it would be very interesting to see what happens. But yeah, like going back to the, the, the example of the rebar, or even better, a derelict ship, if it's something, if it's an object that has value, but there's no evidence of life, that's where I think the idea of global cooperation would not be as present. So there's um, there's another book that I've read that is very that very much tackles this idea called Saturn Run by John Sanford which kind of covers the idea of finding an alien ship that made a stop near the planet Saturn, and then it suddenly, and, and something is left behind. And that's pretty much it as far as contact goes. And what happens, without spoiling anything in the book, what, what you do see is instead of global cooperation or people realizing that, oh, wow, we gotta, you know, get, we have to band together and find out what's happening out there. Instead, what we see are the superpowers of that book, the glo- like the, the global superpowers of that book, competing to get there first. And furthermore, kind of sowing even more dissent and stress with between those two powers' relationships. Now, with your book, Eternal Shadow, Fall of Gods, what motivated you to write this in the first place? And how long did it take? The more I think about it, the more I realize I was likely motivated by old Star Trek episodes. I'm a very huge fan of Gene Roddenberry's creations, and notably Next Generation. But there are some old original series Star Trek episodes that I really loved, too. One of which involved a doomsday machine. And I think that was the name of the episode, too, which basically was a planet-sized ship that destroyed planets by way of... I, re- I remember the episode well. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, I, in retrospect, I feel there was certainly a, a level of subconscious influence there. But also then, you know, you have your Star Wars, you know, and the Death Star and other... Uh, and the idea of something so large that it just it can't be processed by... The human mind like even like the like i had a i had a picture an art piece commissioned for my novel i I never used it in the book um but it's it kind of i had to have it created because it kind of encapsulates just the scale of something as large as a leviathan like what something like and just seeing this thing consuming or destroying a gas giant it's just hard to like even i'm looking at it now and it's just hard to imagine like that really being a thing until it's right in front of you and even then i think a lot of people wouldn't would have a hard time believing it it's interesting because i mean as a hypothetical megastructure a planet destroyer is actually while enormous you could go much further you could build a, a scatter thruster or something like that that's even bigger and it's just mind-boggling the scales that it's at least in principle possible to build on within this universe. But, um, and the universe generally does it. Stars are big, you know, most of, most of the things the universe does it are huge. And what, what the reality of it is, is that we're just so small and insignificant that it's just hard to fathom the, just the scale of everything, whether it's the size of the universe or what's possible to be, you know, exist within it. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's that level of, fascination and wonder that I really kind of embodied here just taking this what if you know the fiction in the hard sci- in the in the hard science <laughs> where I wanted to just explore how we would respond how different types of technologies might be utilized 
uh, whether they are currently in existence today or are in various stages of research or have been mothballed and suddenly are, are brought back from just being a bunch of text on a dusty shelf in a lab somewhere and bringing all that to life for the sake of learning and discovery. It's just simply fascinating to me. Where can people get Eternal Shadow Fall of Gods? It can. It is available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, certainly uh, Google Play, and those are the kind of the, the big three. And it is available as an ebook and paperback. And time for a question out of left field. Favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? Ooh. Okay. Gut gut response. We're in a zoo. The, the so the idea where we we haven't detected anything because other species are preventing us from discovering anything for the sake for our own sakes. The idea that that other species know that we exist and they're either choosing to not respond or they're hiding evidence of their existence or they are manipulating what our own technology could potentially see for the sake of either isolating us or simply using us as a control <laughs> <laughs> against other kind of experiments and they don't want us to know that they are there. It's interesting that it, it could be incremental contact in such a situation so that you, you don't get contacted, for example, until you try to make advanced artificial intelligence. Then you become a threat to everybody in the galaxy because you could lose control over it. So it's sort of one of those things where you're in a zoo up until you get to a certain point. Then you find out there's alien life everywhere. I kind of find that one of the more terrifying uh, scenarios, don't you? I think it says a lot about... It can say a lot about the state of the universe in terms of how civilizations can potentially advance. Or it could say a lot about humanity and how we are just so, like, at a base level, so territorial, where we would rather either prevent others from advancing for our benefit, or if we met something that, was, that suddenly became our equal, we would want to do everything we can to understand it before unleashing it to the greater world as, as a whole. I do think it's quite, it, it can't, the implications of the zoo hypothesis, I think, are very uh, interesting <laughs> and, and scary. They are. And then the variants of it, you know, for example, that they're, they're simply ignoring us. You know, they're not hiding from us. They're just ignoring us. And it, it sort of evokes, actually, my fa one of my favorite sci-fi novels, Rendezvous with Rama, where aliens simply didn't care about us. <laughs> and we just weren't interesting enough. And that you got to wonder what the psychology that would be if, if, if. We saw an alien probe pass through the solar system and kept going. Would the psychology then be everybody was disappointed? Or <laughs> what? why didn't they give us any attention type of thing? It could go that way. Or it could be if it was something that we knew or identified as truly artificial and it came and went, even coming as, as far as you know within our own solar system, it could also be a a trigger for inspiration, driving people to want to find out where it was going and to do whatever it took to get us going in that direction, which I think could go, could cause more harm than good, but it could also be very beneficial for, for mankind. A sense of uh, a kick in the pants from a, in a, his, from a galactic standpoint to get our act together and not focus inward so much. Do you expect that we will see some evidence of intelligent alien life anytime within the next 100 years? Do you think we're close to that, or do you think that's just not likely to happen in reality, or what do you think? In my heart, I would love to be there if we made any kind of contact or something made contact with us, but at the same time, I can't help but feel we're at it like we're at a point in history where humanity can take such incredible strides forward but at the same time we haven't crossed that that maturity threshold that that the another answer to the fermi paradox 
where we haven't crossed a point where we won't potentially destroy ourselves or or sufficiently damage our civilization to the point where we just regress hundreds of years backwards. So, I mean, I feel like we are at a point where we can make many decisions that could, that could take us many different directions. But I guess this, the cynical side of me says that no, we likely won't see anything happen. But at the same time, I just, the inner kid in me is holding out hope. I, yeah, I'm sort of the same way. I, I don't know that we'll ever, I'll ever see it, but I would like to see it. And I hope it's nice when it happens, and I hope it doesn't involve the loss of two gas giants. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Trevor, it was a pleasure talking to you today. No, this was this was great. Thank you so much for having me uh, here today. Yep, and we'll have you back next uh, for the next book you do. No, thank you so much. I, l- I look forward to uh, bringing more of this universe of mine into your hands. There are some indicators of what might happen if a radio signal or some evidence of an alien civilization ever surfaces. On the one hand, there was Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds, though it's often overstated what the effect of that actually was. Few really thought that Martians were invading. But at the time, the idea that Mars had a civilization living on it was rather widespread in the West, due to talk of canals being visible on its surface which really turned out just to be an optical effect from the telescope and perhaps a bit of wishful thinking. And then there is the opposite side of the coin, which is more disconcerting, finding evidence of an alien civilization or never finding it at all. Are we alone? John, what is the opossum holding? That's the carburetor from the LeBaron. Oh dear, we'll have to have that recycled. The possum's building a rocket. The opossum is not building a rocket, John. The heck it's not. For corn's sake, the possum's going to do a launch from the backyard. You had something to do with this, didn't you? No, John. Not a thing.